Welcome to Tennis Spin, where we put our spin on your tennis. So you guys have heard me talking about tennis elbow and my personal opinions about how to treat tennis elbow for over two years now. I thought I'd get another opinion, okay? So my buddy, Dr. Sean is here, and we're gonna actually ask him what he thinks about treating tennis elbow. guys so i got dr sean in the house he's actually a foot specialist podiatrist by trade but i wanted to ask dr sean about tennis elbow because first off he's a tennis player second off he's trained with people who you know work with treating tennis elbow. Dr. Sean, can you add on a little bit more for me? Yeah, I'm Dr. Sean Steenberg, a foot and ankle surgeon uh, who also trains in uh, sports medicine with orthopedic surgery. So uh, I've learned a thing or two about uh, the upper extremity and joints itself, uh, particularly tennis elbow. Um, I've also had tennis elbow. So um, just here to share some tips and knowledge about the uh, tennis elbow itself. So let's start with what causes tennis elbow. Tennis elbow is a uh, overuse injury to the uh, lateral epicondyle of your humerus, which is your arm bone. So um, another name for tennis elbow is lateral epicondylitis. And anytime you have a bone, you're going to have muscles that insert onto an area of the bone uh, through a tendon. So what tennis elbow is, is it's a overuse and, uh, injury of the tendons connecting to the bone. Um, particularly, there's a certain area of the arm that gets it the most, which is your extensor compartment of your arms, which is mainly the muscles up here, which allow your hand to do this. Um, and the main muscle that tends to get injured with tennis elbow is the muscle known as the extensor uh, carpi radialis brevis or the ECRB. Point that. So that would be right about right here. It would enter into your lateral epicondyle of your humerus. So right about there is one mm. of the most common muscles injured or tendons injured uh, with tennis elbow. Okay, look familiar guys? Right here. I, I hear that a lot. Now, I've heard people, and it may not be tennis elbow, okay? They tell mm -hmm. me that sometime it's here, Mm -hmm. Okay. Sometimes it's there where you're talking about. Sometimes it's literally here. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes it's like here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is that all part of that muscle? So the literature supports that uh, other muscles uh, can contribute to tennis elbow. The extensor uh, digitorum muscle group um, is another muscle, which is in a slightly different location where it inserts, so you could get pain there, which would be a diagnosis of tennis elbow. Uh, Sometimes the literature even says that you can get uh, injury in the, the pronator type muscles, which are in a totally different area of, of the arm, um, more so in this area. And then finally, you could get uh, some injuries or tennis elbow-like findings to the uh, ulnar area as well. So different muscles will insert in different areas of your humerus, which could contribute to pain, not particularly at the extensor carpi radialis brevis, but um, in an area near it. So that is why you'll have findings of uh, tennis elbow with different parts of the, the um, forearm. So the main causes is, um, is it overuse or is it use 
using it the wrong way like <laughs> hitting <Yeah>. it late <laughs> yeah no um so you know the literature supports that uh there's theories that tennis elbow is uh attributed to poor technique mm -hmm. you know when, when it comes to hitting a ball you know there the kinetic chain supports using your body more to uh, hit a ball and if you have an overuse injury where you say that you're arming the ball too much you're doing a lot of this you know you're using your arm too much and it puts a lot of uh, tension, you can see it here on this muscle group here, uh, particularly on the insertion to your uh, humerus here, which would be the um, findings co uh, consistent with tennis elbow or lateral epicondylitis. Got it. I've um, told the viewers over the last two years that most tennis elbow is from a backhand slice. Yeah. And, and it's because when you look at the pros, it looks like they're doing this like mm -hmm. they're doing they're constantly bending and then straightening it back out on contact mm -hmm. but it, it's actually not what they're doing they're actually doing this and then as they come through they're keeping it bent a little bit what by the time it's straight if even if it gets straight it, it's kind of the ball's already gone mm -hmm. so by doing this motion they are hyper extending every time yeah, the uh, literature also supports uh, tennis elbow is uh, mainly found in players with the one-handed uh, backhand mm. uh, because a lot of the uh, vibrational forces you get from the ball hitting the racket, particularly on the one-handed backhand, go directly uh, up the arm proximally hitting uh, the specific muscles in this area, which um, when painful contribute to the diagnosis of a, a tennis elbow. So Thank you. It, it would make sense that a slice backhand so I'm doing a lot of this motion. Um, it's activating the muscles in this area um, with, you know, some vibrational forces from the ball impacting the racket uh, could communicate that vibrational forces to this area of your arm. So since mm -hmm. you suffer from tennis elbow yourself, what mm -hmm. were the causes for you? Uh, for me, I, I went through a lot of the different variables that could contribute to tennis elbow. I think one of them for me was this the grip that was too small for my hand. I oh. um so I uh I actually went from a four and a half to a four and a quarter, which was too drastic of a change. Um so what ended up happening was I was gripping the the the, the racket grip tighter. Mm -hmm. So as opposed to a loose grip, I was really kind of gripping and it puts a lot of tension in this area. Mm. Um and the literature supports there there's a study that says that increased grip forces contribute to more vibrational uh, forces and, and trauma to the area of uh, where tennis elbow occurs so the tidier grip the literature said that it contributes to more uh, incidences of tennis elbow since we're at grip sizes let's mm -hmm. start into the remedies of tennis elbow mm -hmm. so since you said the, the simplest and the cheapest remedy would i mean it would tell me that we can just get an overgrip yeah say for example you buy a racket you know unfortunately the grip size is too small there's a uh, very effective and uh practical ways to increase uh, increase grip size you can use uh, over grips you could actually layer them um over the under grip and increase the grip size um to the point where you will have a, a looser grip and that would alleviate some of the stress you would put on the tendons connecting to your elbow. So, I mean, you could use a variety of overgrips. Uh, these are some Dunlop ones. Um, certain overgrips are thicker than others. Some are made thinner, some are made thicker. You know, this is kind of a, a thing you do to your personal preference. Um, I know a lot of players actually now will buy the small grip and then they'll just like layer on overgrips mm -hmm. to where they make it as uh, cushiony as possible and also as comfortable as possible to create kind of a very kind of looser, more comfortable grip as they're holding the racket. Got it. So this is a good option to start. I like the uh, over grip. So that's cheap option number one that mm -hmm. definitely could work. Now, this thing that's called a vibration dampener. How much vibration and how much dampening in that little thing? So these are these are interesting because um, when they first came out, I think they were marketed to to say they reduce vibration, which I, I believe they do. Um, a lot of it has to do with the sound uh, mm -hmm. that it, that your racket makes also with a dampener. It's a little different, but uh, the literature sh uh, shows that uh, vibrational frequencies of um, 80 to 200 
uh, are the levels that contribute to tennis elbow. Uh, there's a study done on dampeners and it showed that they were only able to address uh, vibrational frequencies above 200. So if it's above 200, that's not targeting the uh, sweet spot of frequencies that contribute to tennis elbow, which is 80 to 200. So um, the literature doesn't support that dampeners as of right now um, reduce the uh, vibrational frequencies to the point where it'll uh, treat or prevent tennis elbow. Um, and that, of course, is related to the uh, frequency level of vibrations that they, they can stop. So it's essentially a sound dampener. Uh, for the most part, it, it is. It also, it, I mean, like I said, it does stop some vibration, but not necessarily the ones that are um, attributed to tennis elbow, which is like the 80 to 200. Got it. So moving on to the next thing that we could help our tennis elbow, mm -hmm. um, let's go natural gut. Great. I think this is a great uh, uh, thing to address. So um, the literature supports that actually string tension is uh, directly related to incidences of uh, tennis elbow. And they, th there's a study that said that strings with uh, less tension actually had lesser incidences of um, tennis, tennis elbow, elbow or mm -hmm. vibrational forces to uh, the arm. So when we talk about strings, this is kind of like we're going to the extreme here. We got natural gut. <laughs> this stuff's pretty elastic. It's not a very stiff string. So elasticity is like how much it bends. So when the ball hits it, it's going to bend a lot. Um, so, you know, if we compare it to like the opposite end of the spectrum, let's say like a Luxalon, uh, poly, which doesn't bend a lot, that's going to be more stiff as mm -hmm. they say versus this, which is more elastic. So this is another thing that you can adjust to for tennis elbows. So what I did, uh, also to help with my tennis elbow pain, I went to a softer string. I think at the time I was playing with like Babolat Pro Hurricane full bed at like 60. Mm -hmm. So I was getting a lot of, a lot of stress <laughs> and vibrational frequencies going to my arm. So I actually switched to a softer uh, poly. They make softer polys now. But if you can't um, tolerate a poly, it's definitely good to just switch up to like a softer string, a multi-filament or a natural gut. Natural gut has the highest F uh, elasticity of all the strings so this is going to allow the strings to bend and absorb some of that energy from the ball as opposed to that energy going directly to uh through the racket into your arm got it so looser tension yeah. softer string now going going into like braces now mm -hmm. so something like that something yeah. like this uh, mm -hmm. we got these the three major brands plus you know i got an elbow sleeve which yeah. i've used for myself too mm -hmm. Um, how much do these things help? So these these are actually really good for preventative measures. Um, I actually used this one when I got tennis elbow. And the treatment theory behind these is anytime you get uh, joint soreness, there's um, the conservative treatment option, which is an acronym. It's called RICE therapy. It's not actually RICE, but no. it's R-I-C-E. So the R stands for rest. Okay. Um, so you can always rest the joint that's in pain. Ice, icing you can do afterwards and before. And then there's C, which is compression. And that's where these kind of fall into. Um, so what compression does is it allows the uh, muscles in the area to be more like stable. So when you have a unstable elbow or elbow that's not stable, um, when those vibrational forces hit it, you're gonna be more prone to tennis elbow. So what these do, these help compress that muscle group and create some more stable uh, muscle area around the joint. Um, so these actually are pretty good with preventing tennis elbow. Um, I do like these. Uh, so these are something you can, you can try and use to help alleviate the pain. A lot of you guys, um, who come in here, they're like, my arm is in pain. My tennis elbow is severe. And when I say rest, <laughs> they're like, I can't and I won't. So they wind up with a brace and they wind up going back out there and continuing to put more strain on their elbow. Right. Um, is putting one of those on going to actually help if you're already at the point of extreme pain? Uh, good question. I, it would help to a certain extent, but it's not going to, you're going to wear it and it's not going to treat the condition. So Part of that acronym RICE, or Rest, Ice, Compression, Elevation, uh, you, you should always start with rest. I know it's hard to do when you play tennis and let's say you do it a lot. You have to have the pain subside a bit before you can graduate to like compression. Um, and then after you treat the tennis elbow with the pain, you have to do certain things to prevent it from coming back. 
Because mm -hmm. I know people that's literally suffering from this for three months mm -hmm. and um, like they've rested for three months. Yeah. And as soon as they play, it's like, oh, it comes right back. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. The literature says it takes about six to 12 months to actually completely heal. Yeah. With Whoa. conservative treatment options. Yeah. Six to 12 months, guys. Mm -hmm. Use your left arm if you keep <laughs> wanting to play. Yes. All right. Because <laughs> it's not going to be quick. Okay. So let's look at some um, grips here. Mm -hmm. We got the VT grip, which you just tried. So uh, I did a little research on this, not particularly on the grip, but with vibrational technology. So there's a study out there that had some rackets modified with um, vibrational technology. And the, the data showed that rackets with vibrational technology um, transmitted less vibrational forces. Uh, so I had this on my Pure Drive, which is one of the stiffer rackets out there. I think the uh, RDC rating of that's like 71, 72. Mm -hmm. And uh, generally when I play with that, I play with a full poly setup. Um, when I play with that, I usually, if I play for a long time, I'll start to get like a little bit of pain in my wrist, sometimes up here, not to the point where it's like tennis elbow or like wrist pain that'll stop me from playing for a day or so. Just kind of like little aches and pains that most you know athletes get anyway. But when I use this, particularly like I'll notice that when I hit uh, the frame or shank, mm -hmm. I actually, I, I, so I usually get the pain once that happens. But when I had this on and I did that, I didn't get any of that pain. So, I mean, it's a small sample size with me, just one person, but I, I think they, they do work to a certain certain extent. So I'm actually kind of happy with these. There you go. Yeah. You would know you're the player too. Okay, so a lot of the the my clients that come in here said that when they develop the tennis elbow, they're, they said, my doctor, they, use, they say this, my doctor says to get a more flexible racket. And I'm like thinking to myself, Okay, so you're a 3.0, 3.5, you're hitting the ball wrong, your technique is bad, and you they want me to get you a flexible racket. W what are your thoughts on that? When the um, ball hits the frame, it's going to bend, so mm -hmm. all the forces uh, from the ball are going to go into the frame and bend as opposed to, like let's say, a stiff racket where it just hits the frame, the frame doesn't bend, it just communicates all the way down into your uh, elbow, wrist, things like that. So um, I think the, the whole flexible racket obviously is a good option. And I think the racket companies now are creating a good medium between having a light, wide bodied frame with flexibility. And then also the literature supports that a wider bodied uh, racket, something with a big head is actually better for uh, tennis elbow as well because of the torsional forces um so when you have a wire body frame like this you have a bigger sweet spot mm -hmm. so the literature always says that you know when you hit a ball you want to hit in the sweet spot because that is the area of the racket that will give you the best energy uh to arm um ratio where it's like not overwhelmingly going to your arm so we gave you a guideline guys brought the doc in to help all right so take it one step at a time okay go with like the cheapest to the most expensive now what do you think about surgery does it work when do we get there so surgery yes it does work uh it's usually kind of the later end of your treatment plan you always go from conservative to surgical um and i think you know the symptoms of tennis elbow can be kind of stopped within that conservative treatment after surgery, how long are you out for? Um, you know, it depends on the type of surgery. If you do like a, let's say, arthroscopic surgery where the incision's less um, less invasive versus like a, like just a debridement of the tendon, I mean, you could be out for, for months, you know, and then you have to do physical therapy to get your arm back into oh. to getting that motion back and strengthening it. So it really depends on the patient and the type of surgery you do. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, if you want to take a rest from it, that's a forceful rest from, <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> from um, tennis. Um, the other, I don't know if we did address this either, but you know, you could do the stretches before. These really help me too. Before you even play, um, you know, it's always addresses the extensor compartment. You know, you have this one. Really stretch out these muscles before you use them, before you even hit. Mm. You know, you pull this down about 15 seconds. I don't know, you could do three sets of this. Um, and then obviously you can stretch the pinky out. That helps a lot too. Go the other way. And then just, you know, get this whole range of motion back 
before you, you know, grab a racket and go out there and hit. And I think uh, physical therapy and doctors of physical therapy will, you know, teach you certain stretches and things like that to get your arm kind of ready for uh, playing. And then also once your arm is all healed up from the tennis elbow, it's very important to strengthen it. Um, so they'll give you exercises to do a lot of involve this motion here, which will um, activate the muscles in the extensor compartment, which are uh, the ones affected by tennis elbow. You know, I've heard of a lot of people having success doing exactly what uh, the doc said here. Other other things I, I've read about for physical therapy, you could do something like you could use a spoon and massage the area and it promotes healing factors to that area uh, of aggravation. It's Chinese medicine. It's called rolfing. Oh, all right. There you go. Yeah. So, you know, that, that can work too. You know, it's all about trying out these conservative treatment options before just jumping into surgery, you know. So um, I think uh, the thing with tennis elbow, it's very common, but it has a lot of success with conservative treatment. Got it. We, have, we didn't address um, cortisone shot. So, yes. <laughs> so I know that a lot of docs go cortisone before surgery. Is that yes. right? Uh, for the most part, you graduate from least invasive to more invasive. So the next step, if let's say, you know, physical therapy, adjustments to your racket equipment, things like that doesn't work, you'd always get a, stero a steroid shot. But of course, the issue with steroid injections is you can only get a certain amount. Mm. Um, and then it sometimes it doesn't address the issue. I mean, it's sometimes it's more of like a Band-Aid, mm -hmm. whereas you're not treating the underlying condition. You're not strengthening the muscles in your extensor compartment. You're not... Uh, changing the equipment to prevent the tennis elbow from coming back. You're not, you know, bracing. You're kind of just covering up yeah. the inflammation. And then if you're not treating the underlying condition, that inflammation is going to come back. Like you said, it's temporary relief. It's anywhere from three to six months, a year, if, mm -hmm. if that, um, that it actually helps. So, but it's basically the final step to cutting you open. <laughs> yeah, for the most part, you know, there's that, and then you could have, once again, uh, PRP, which is right. taking your platelets, uh, concentrate them a bit, and inject them into the area that is inflamed, and that will help heal. I think that that's like a newer type of treatment that's kind of like in between, you know, the, the shot versus more invasive procedure like arthroscopic surgery or something like that. So let, let's talk about PRP real quick. <laughs> um, I... Uh, from what I know, PRP is them taking your blood, your own blood, mm -hmm. concentrating it up by spinning it, spinning it, spinning it, mm -hmm. and re-injecting it back into the spot that's hurting you. Uh, yeah, in a nutshell, that's uh, what it does. And what you're doing is you're concentrating the uh, platelets and then, you know, you inject that into the area of question, like directly targeting it, and it increases the healing factors, uh, brings in all the healing factors to that um, in area that's inflamed. Right. Um, drawbacks of it, obviously, is practicality, too. It's pretty expensive. I don't think a lot of insurance covers it just yet. Mm -mm. Um, so it's, a, it's more of a, 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 a private-type clinic uh, application, but it does work. It's got a lot of success. So there's a lot of options out there for your tennis elbow. Like I said, start with the lowest overgrip before you get cut open at the highest. Okay? Want to thank my man, Dr. Sean for hanging out with me today. Uh, if you want to get a hold of Dr. Sean or have any questions for him, where can they reach you? Um, I have an email or Instagram account that will be provided uh, in this video. You can click that link and then I'll be more than happy to answer any of your questions. He's going to provide an email to you guys, guys. He must like you guys a lot. <laughs> it was a pleasure to have Dr. Sean here. I'm glad I was able to share him with you in regards to your tennis elbow. Guys, thank you for watching Tennis Spin, where we put our spin on your tennis. You know, most people, they quit tennis because, you know, it's hard to find somebody to play with, right? I'm just, I just feel so lucky to have my buddy, my buddy Coach Rob, that we have so much in common. You know, we're, we're both kind of follically impaired. You know, ain't that right, Coach Rob? Us follically challenged friends have to hit together. Yes, so I have Coach Rob. If you guys need a friend and you're follically impaired or are a bearded one and looking for your bearded mate, right? Check out Player Court. They have people 
that look like you, play like you, maybe act like you, check out their site. It's playyourcourt.com. Your tennis buddy can teach you how to twirl. Hopefully You'll get better it someday. Than that. Hopefully better than that. We'll have to keep practicing here. <laughs>